Hello guys. Yeah, so today we're looking at the restios. Let's quickly do those restios, my favorite plants in the world. Um, simply because they're so, so straightforward, but they're so beautiful and they're so perfectly adapted to the windy conditions of Cape Town. Okay, so let's get our lesson ready. Our lesson will look like this. There it is, there we start. <clears throat> Here in the lesson on the first page, I give you an introduction to what restios are. Because a lot of people will call them reeds or whatever, but they are in actual fact not a reed. They're not a grass, even some of them look like grasses, but they are restios, restios. And they're part of the Fainbos family, a very important part. Do you remember those four families? They are one of those four families. You get the, the Proteas, the Ericas, the Restios, and the Geophytes. Later on, we're going to do some Geophytes. Now, the Restios are usually what the scientists say. If you get a, a large area of vegetation, and there's no Restios to be found there, then it is most probably not Fainbos. They say that Fainbos is a distinguishing factor, of Restios are a distinguishing factor when it comes to Fainbos. That means if you see any Restios around, you know it is Fainbos. That's easy enough for us to know. Here's also some fast facts that they say. Evergreen plant. Now most of our Fainbos are evergreen and that's lovely. It gives us a green feeling all year round and not like the European countries where all the leaves from the trees fall down when it's autumn and winter time and everything is gloomy. I remember when I was in Switzerland, I took some pictures in the snow and it, the pictures came out black and white. It looked like everything was just black and white. There was no color around, but we don't have that. We've got our lovely evergreen plants. The male and the female plants are always separate on restios, just like the leucodendrons. Can you remember the leucodendrons? Now, these uh, restios, males one side, females other side, and they find each other on, in very interesting ways. We will speak about that. Other names for restios are reeds. Some Afrikaans people call it, call it bisis. Species are like reeds. Dacrit, dacrit, they call it that because dac means when you, what they put on the roofs, uh, thatching, thatching um, grass. And I, of course, and we in the Cape call it restios. There's only about 480 species worldwide. That's not a lot. And we've got a lot of that here in the Cape Floristic region. And they are a very easy plant, grow in very dry areas or even wetlands. We see that all over. And it's a lovely plant to have in your garden because you don't have to water it so often. It just takes care of itself and it's always looking good. Let's go a little bit down in this lesson to some new words. Now, when the scientists talk about restios, they give everything a different name. We don't have to do that. We just go in the way we know. So they will call the stems, the culm, those are the long stems. The leaves are called the sheaths and I'll show you some pictures and you won't even see the leaves. They are very different. The flowers are called spikelets. Flowers here in the end, if you grab one flower in your hand you can feel why it's called a spikelet. It's a bit spiky. And then the fruits or sometimes called nuts, or sometimes it's a, a capsule, and we'll speak about that some more. Now let's look at the first column here, that's the columns, the, the stems. And those are the parts of the plant, look at this picture, where you can find the greenness. That means that is the part of the plant that photosynthesize. So it's got those the green bits in it. The green bits are the parts of the plant that photosynthesize using the sun to make food. Usually that is the job of the, the leaves, but then this plant 
the, the stem is doing that job. The stem is green. Now, if we go next door to the sheaths, what we know now is the leaves, these ones. We look at this picture of the leaf and it doesn't look like a leaf at all. Now we call it a reduced leaf. Anything that is reduced means it doesn't really have a lot of um, benefit to the plant. It, it doesn't have a lot of job, uh, a lot of work to do for the plant. Now this is a little brown reduced leaf, so it can't make any um, food. It can't photosynthesize. Another thing that we often speak about re a reduced um, is if we think of uh, the skeleton of a whale, if we look at the flipper of a whale, it looks just, the bones look exactly the same as a human arm would look like, but they are reduced, they're smaller, and they sit in these little flippers and they aren't very useful. They can wave at you, but the, the, we call them a reduced arm if we look at the skeleton. And this is a little reduced leaf because it can't do anything really. It sits here where we find the nodes of the stem. Now the stem of a ratio is divided in nodes. That means it's got little um, places where it, it looks like it's been joined together. Yeah, in this picture we can see it clearly there and there sits the little leaf. And the leaf is tiny. It wraps around the, the plant and it's open on the one side. It's like a piece of paper that's just wrapped around it. It's beautiful now. It makes it really look beautiful. And in the males and the female plants, they look ex exactly the same. So you can't even tell them apart. The only place where you can tell apart the males and the female plants if you look at the flowers. And then let's look at the flowers or the spikelets. Remember, we call them the spikelets because they're spiky when you grab them. The spikelets are not one flower in, on a stem like that. But if you look closely, they are microscopic flowers. There can be anything between 50 and 500 flowers on a little spikelet. So if you take it apart, the tiny, it looks like little balls. It's tiny little flowers all sit together there. And the, the males and the females like look completely different. And those are the ones that give us the clue um, which are male and which are female. Now let's look at the ones here below. Can you see at this picture, there you'll see the flower sitting, the spikelet on the inside, but it has this little sail almost, this little cup around it. And that little cup we often find in the female flowers. It is like a sail or a cup, if you think of a sail like this. Now, if the wind brings the pollen, because ratios rely on the wind to bring, to move pollen between the male and the female flowers. So if the pollen is moved from the male flower to the female flower, it blows in the air. Now, this is much bigger than the flower. It will go into this cup and the wind will make a little woof. It will swing the pollen around so it spends more time and has a better chance of being picked up by the female flower. Isn't that amazing? So it's got this little device on it to help with pollination and to actually modify the wind around the flower so that pollination can take place. I think it's fascinating. How can a plant be this clever? My goodness. Let's go to the next page where we'll have some more information. Now, here we have ratios and pollination. Let's look at what they see, what they say here. Wind pollination. So we've learned that a lot of plants use the wind because we've got so much wind here in um, Cape Town. So the wind is always here, so why not use it? So a lot of plants use it, especially if plants sit apart. If the males and the females sit apart, let's use the wind. So it means, if they use the wind, it means they do not have to attract insects or birds by having bright colors or sweet nectar. So you won't find any birds sitting on any restios because they do not have nectar and birds go after the nectar. 
but I have seen bees, a whole swarm of bees was once in my um, Grecia bush. And of course, I was wondering, what, what are they doing there? They don't, they're not going to find any nectar. But they were after the pollen. And then I knew I had a male plant. Yeah. So they are actually after, the bees were after the pollen, because bees eat pollen and nectar. So, but otherwise, if you look at this flower, there's nothing nice there to attract them. There's only that one time that I saw the bees there, and I think that was by chance, that they like, flew by and said, oh, lots of pollen. Because nothing is attracting them. They're not beautiful colors, no sweet smell, nothing there to attract. Because the rest here says, don't worry, I'll use the wind. Okay. Now, because they use the wind, it says here male flowers produce large amounts of pollen and release it into the air from large anthers that are usually hanging outside the flower. Now, the anther is like, it looks like little anthro, anthers. They're hanging outside and they shake out the pollen. Now, most of the male flowers you will see on restios hang. They hang like this because the wind need to shake the pollen out. The female flowers will stand up like this and they will have little things coming out of them. That is the female parts of the flowers. I've got a picture here. Let me show you what it can look like. While we're busy here with the um, female parts of the flower, I quickly want to show you something um, beautiful. Look at this female part of the, the restio flower. This is just a little piece of the whole flower, but look at these pink parts that come out, and those are the parts that have to capture the um, pollen out of the air. And because they are not sticky, like the ones used, uh, that flowers use, that are pollinated by insects, they have these little cups around them. Remember these papery cups that will capture the wind? And those help her to, to catch the pollen out of the air. Isn't it absolutely amazing? The anthers of the males are usually yellow. So you will see tiny little yellow things coming out of the flowers. But in the female ones, you see the pink ones or different colors. And they catch the pollen. Okay. So pollen is all also not sticky like insect pollen. Insect pollen is sticky because it needs to go on the insect and it has to stay there while it's flying over to the next flower. Now, if you don't really, you're not gonna use the insect, your pollen do not, does not have to be sticky. It will have to be round and smooth so the wind can take it and blow it like dust to the next plant. So the styles from the female plants are very feathery. We saw those lovely pink ones. And they also hang outside of the plant in order to filter pollen out of the air. Now, if we've got different species of um, restios, you might have one that looks completely different to the other one. The pollen of the one can't go onto the wrong species of the other one. They have chemical signals and, and a, st a different structure, even though they're so small, they just cannot go to the wrong plant. It's just like a puzzle, it won't fit. So it will just go off. So when they find the right puzzle, they link together and it, they get um, pollinated. Fascinating, eh? It is so small, nobody knows what's going on. We might be walking there, inhaling all of these wonderful pollen from the restiums. Now, this is a very interesting bit about the seeds, not usual seeds. They say the seeds are one to two millimeters long, tiny, like tiny, tiny. You will probably not see it. They say under a microscope, you can see that different seeds have different and beautiful patterns on the surface. It actually mimics sand grains. Is this camouflage? Now, a lot of researchers have looked at the different um, seeds under a microscope because different seed patterns show you different species. But now they're asking, 
are these actually camouflage that the plants are using um, to hide their seeds while their seeds are laying in the sand under the plant? Why do I want to camouflage my seeds? Because I don't want anybody to eat it. Those are my children. I need them to grow. So some seeds are tiny and they lay there, look like little sand grains. Some are a little bigger and some have a little of a wing that can help them to go a little bit further from the mother plant. Um, but some of them are very large and they almost like a nut. Look at this picture. They look like nuts. And those are the ones that the ants like. Because there's a little bit there on this side that the ants will eat. So the ants will pick them up and carry them under the ground into their nests where they can actually eat the yummy part of it. Yummy, look at my word there, yummy means delicious because it's full of oil. They eat that fleshy bit off and then they chuck away the actual seed. But then the seed is safe under the ground because if a mouse or a rat will get the seed, they will eat the whole thing with the seed and everything. So the ants protect the seeds by taking them underground, but they do not damage them. Now some larger nuts, um, larger seeds, what they call nuts, are sometimes too big for the ants to pick up. But the researchers have been seeing that they will be hidden in the ground, further underground, a little way Ants don't really go. It's not an ant's nest. It's like it was buried there. And then researchers suspected that it was mice that would pick them up and bury them for later and um, put them in the ground there and maybe forgot about it and later on couldn't find it again and then it will start growing. But now researchers have looked into this even better because a lot of these little nuts look like little uh, antelope, antelope droppings, little boktrolikis. So they realized that these little boktroliki lookalikes are fooling the um, dung beetles. And the dung beetles are taking them underground, hiding them, because they think it's a, it's a lovely poo, but it isn't, of course. So they're completely fooled. But could the plant be that clever and to think, if I make my little nut or my little um, seed look like a book troliki or a, uh, some antelope poo, then this animal will help me to, to bury it. I think it's fascinating. Plants are very clever. Okay, so let's go on to the germination. Seeds germinate right after the first rains. So if they've fallen out on the ground or been buried by a, a mouse or a, whatever buried it, a dung beetle or an ant, um, as soon as it starts raining, those seeds will start growing. And that means it's early in winter time. And that's good because they grow the whole winter time. Winter time in the Cape is grow season. Even my children grow faster in winter. So by the time summer comes and there's less rain and it's hotter, those plants are big enough to survive. If they're too small, they will fry out in the heat. They will dry up. Now, the bigger the seed um, or the nut that's been buried, the deeper the root will be. So if it's tiny little seeds, they will be tiny plants with tiny roots and they will actually dry up quicker in the heat. But if it's a bigger seed that's deeper into the soil, it will, t it will have a deeper root and that will help it to survive better. Now, if a plant has tiny seeds, usually it will have a lot of them because a lot of them will also die in the heat. But if they have bigger seeds, those seeds usually um, are less 
because they the survival rate is better they just survive better because they've got this large tap root you see lever plants only when a plant is about three years old does it actually start to look like a restio before that it will look like grass and the animals will, of course love that juicy grass they they on the especially after a burn when the restios are the first ones to come up they will start to um, graze on that okay so now i'm going to look at the um, interactions with animals and this is very interesting you have your normal grazers that will come around to um, the ratios like your flay rats dassies flay rat is just like a, a, a normal big size rat but they're extremely cute they've got little short faces they don't don't look like the city rats that make you that's a bit creepy uh, the dassies that live on the, the rocks and the clip spring also in that area, they graze on the restios. Um, and the flay rats often cut them off in little pieces and they will use those little pieces to um, put in their nest, to build their nest with. So sometimes you will see the little pieces where the flay rats have um, uh, grazed on the, the restio. Then you have several bug species that love to eat pollen. And some of them can even strip the whole plant of all its pollen. It will literally take all the pollen off of that plant. That means that plant will be useless this year for um, pollinating any female plants. And it will have to wait until next year to produce pollen again. So if you have an infestation of those bugs, it can wreak havoc in a community of restios. Um, but I've never seen that too often to happen. Sometimes when you shake the ratio bushes, you'll see all the pollen come out. Almost sometimes it's a yellow, like a yellow cloud. Now, another bug that you get often that uh, feed on the ratios is the leaf hoppers. Now look at this amazing pictures that I found of leaf hoppers, because I never knew what a leaf hopper looked like. Look at this. It looks like a big old moth or maybe a, one of those cicadas. Some are just green, but look at these. Have you ever seen these before? They don't look like they can actually do much harm to a plant, but they say we have to look at the mouth parts. Look at this mouth part, like a giant mosquito mouth part. And look how it's inserting that mouth part into this plant. And it actually sucks the juice out of that plant. All the sap, all the water in that plant gets sucked out until that plant shrivels up and it becomes like dry grass. You cannot believe it very quickly. I've seen it happen before. I've not seen the leaf hoppers on the plant, but I've seen the, the plant dying so quickly. And I was thinking, it looks like somebody has sucked the insides out of this plant. And that must have been a leaf hopper that can do such damage to a plant. So here's our um, group of animals that love the restios. The, the field mice will be on there to eat the seeds and take the seeds back um, to their nest for their little ones. And the flay rats will chop it down. Several bug species and animal species loving our lovely restios. Now fire is a very interesting thing when it comes to paintballs. You've heard now people say paintballs like fire, but it's not like they like fire, who's going to like fire? But they get benefit from the fire, so they make the best of a fire. So ratio is the same. Look at this ratio in this picture. It was completely destroyed by fire. But the part underneath the ground was not destroyed and, and that could start growing again. So even it looks like it's just grass growing out of this, um, this old restio plant, it's actually re-sprouting. And the, in the beginning it will look like that and if no zebra comes along and eats it all off, it will actually grow into a, a complete new plant again. And for those little seedlings that, or the little seeds that's been hidden away under the ground, they are protected from the fire. So they're not destroyed by the fire, but the fire will actually 
um, stimulate them to start growing, kind of tickle them and say, oh, this heat coming over must be fire. Maybe it's time for me to grow. Maybe there's no other ratio plants left over and it's, I'm needed now to start growing. So um, they will start growing after fire very quickly. But imagine if there's another fire coming through that area. It will kill all those little ones and maybe some of the bigger ones. Um, and that will be horrible because then it might not have enough uh, seeds left in the ground to grow in next season. And you might lose some species in the area. That's why they say fangos do need fire, but not that often because it can kill the little plants. What about ratios and people? I should have put a picture here of myself loving ratios. It's a beautiful garden plant um, and it doesn't need a lot of attention. You just leave it and you just admire it because it's so pretty. But the poison people in the olden days used to build their houses from um, restios. And they used to make these uh, thick mats. These were the one on the pictures, one that would stay there for quite some time. But in the old days, they, they used to travel a lot with the cattle, moving the cattle from grazing ground to grazing ground. So they would need to pack up the whole hut. And so they would make a mat. All the, the different little restio reeds will be woven together into a mat that they can roll up and just put on the donkey when they have to go to the next place. And they, they didn't know it, but they were so clever using the, the reeds because in winter time, the reeds, the, the, the stem of the restio sucks up moisture and it actually expands. So if this was the reed, in normal uh, times, it, in winter time, it will suck up moisture because there's a lot of moisture around and it will be bigger like this. So if they sit together in a mat, they will start pushing together and there was no ways of any air coming through the mat. In other words, these mats would get really good insulated um, insulation mats on their shelters. No wind would get through it. But in summer times, when the reeds dry out and they lose the moisture, they become smaller again, thinner, and there's some spaces in between them where the wind can blow through and cool the hut down. Especially in places like Namakwaland, where it gets really hot in summer, um, you, it's nice if the wind can blow through your shelter or, or your, your little hut a little bit. Eh? So people were very clever in those days. They knew what to use and what worked best. These days we also use restios, but we use it for thatching on roofs. Um, but I still see every now and then when I go into some communities, I see some of the old grandmas make their brooms out of the restios. And that used to be a broom. You still get these brooms that are made from grasses or restios. Um, and that's the olden day brooms. We always used to have grass brooms. Um, now, nowadays you don't see it anymore, but I remember as a child, we always had the, the grass brooms. Those are the ones that we use outside. So those are, restios are perfect broom material. Now, if we go a bit lower on this lesson, you can see the different pictures of different kind of restios. And when you walk in the felt, you actually see it all over the place. But some of them are more common than others, like these ones over here, this third picture, you'll really see all over the place. I had a little video here of a Martha Stewart video on how to plant restios, but it looks like Martha Stewart removed that video from her uh, website. I was actually asked her, write her and ask her to put it back because it was an amazing video. Um, so don't bother going there anymore. I'll still try to find something else. So these were our beautiful restios, wonderful restios. I hope you enjoyed the lesson and all learning about all the bugs and the things impacting um, our restios. Restios are just beautiful to love and you will always have a win situation if you plant them in your garden. So go out next time we go to the nursery, pick out a lovely restio for your garden. 
See you next time for Geophytes. We're going underground. Thanks, guys.